Most important here is to know your limits, um, especially when you start poking around on anything high voltage. You know, know when to say when and, and when to, to bail out and call the professionals. But um, I'll tell you a little bit here about work and save. We'll just go down the list here. Have a dry, well-lit, clean environment when working with electricity. That's something that I am really, really bad about. <laughs> Having everything at my feet and all over the place and tripping. And I broke my finger out here um, a couple of years ago working on the motors out there. And I, I had the motor running and I, you know, it was dark, and the little uh, pulley caught my glove and pulled my finger in and almost lost my finger. And it was a dark, dirty, um, it was actually a pretty wet environment. It was just a, a, the, the trifecta of wrong environment to be working in. And it was late. It was like 7 o'clock at night. I'd been here for 12 hours already. Yeah, be awake. Be aware. Don't do this stuff when you're compromised in any way. Redundancy is probably first and foremost, the most important thing to do. Um, test it. If you're looking for voltage, who's seen one of these? The little voltage testing pins? You have five bucks, maybe? What it will do is light up if you've got high voltage. See? Got that little red light comes on. If you're, like, about to cut into a high voltage wire or something. Yeah, use this guy first, you know, when you know if you're messing around with some high voltage. Use your voltmeter, too, because sometimes these things will just go off. Like, if you, some of the cheap ones, if you just tap them, they'll go off, too. And you never really know for sure. At least I don't. So use them both. I had to cut a, a hole in my wall um, for some uh, ductwork at my house, and I had to move a wire. The only way I could tell if that wire was hot was with one of these, you know. So um, those things are great. Uh, a lot of these meters actually have them built in, too. This meter has been fantastic. I actually just bought one for myself because I like it so much. It measures AC and DC current for 30 bucks or 35, 45, something like that. Um, does all of it. And then that NCV at the top is a non contact voltage meter. So it does the same thing that this does. And it has a little light right there that comes on. Love this little meter, and it's real small. It fits in your pocket. I like that. Lockout tagout is important, especially if you're working in a facility with other people. If you're working on some like circuitry that could be energized, say somebody says, like, oh, that switch shouldn't be off, and then he flips it on, and you get shocked or electrocuted. It's, uh, lockout is where you take like that mechanism, the handle or the switch, and you lock it in some fashion that, so that it cannot be energized. And tag out says, like, go see Dan before doing anything with this switch, right? So a lot of times what I'll do if I'm around my house or something or working and I, and I have to, like, flip a breaker, it's just put a piece of tape over that breaker, you know, and that works. And they make little lockout mechanisms for breakers. If you're messing with safeties and guard switches and that kind of thing, like, say, for instance, your lawnmower, you, you've got a riding lawnmower. I've got a little switch that says my deck is engaged, right? So what if I assume that my deck is not engaged and I go to turn my lawnmower on and I bypass that switch or something? Who knows? Maybe my lawnmower is going to start spinning that blade when I don't think it is. The point is, observe those little safety switches, especially if you're going to go modifying things. And know that, you know, know what position it's in before you re-energize your equipment. We were talking about capacitors a little bit. It just looks like a little closed cylinder with two wires coming off of it. Beware, those can hold a charge. They're basically like little batteries. Not entirely, but you can think of them that way. They'll hold a charge, sometimes a pretty aggressive charge. That would be the main reason why you don't go opening up old-style TVs that are full of capacitors that can really mess you up. So that's one thing at Repair Cafe. We won't be taking in any TVs. Don't bring your TV. Wind testing, especially high voltage, a couple of things you can do to protect yourself if you make a mistake. Use one hand. If you're using two hands, electricity is going to flow across your chest. Okay? If you use one hand, it's going to bypass your chest and go from you to ground. Right? One thing else you can do is insulate yourself from ground. I used to know this kind of rogue electrician always did stuff kind of off the books. And he would carry around a foam mat with him. And he would just stand on a foam mat. One time I saw him, he was reworking a meter, and he was standing on a foam mat in a puddle. But it didn't matter. He still had his foam mat. <laughs> but he was, uh, so um, <laughs> anyway, at least he felt safe. 
Insulated tools. I've got an insulated screwdriver in here that I'll show you. Yeah, here's an insulated screwdriver. So the only exposed part is that little tip. That way, if you're doing like what I did when I was testing the voltage out here, you go in there and press that, you know, you're not going to arc or, or do anything. Um, safety glasses and obviously know your limits. Again, don't get in over your head. For the most part, things technically fall under three different kinds of loads. We're going to talk about resistive loads and inductive loads. Basically, uh, resistive loads are your heaters and your lights, old style lights, incandescent light bulbs. And they just work off of the internal resistance of whatever it is. Resistance is resistance. I think we all kind of get that, right? Let's imagine we got a, a bucket of water or a tank of water or whatever. OK? And then we've got comes, a big pipe comes out. And let's say it reduces down to a small pipe right here, right? And then you open up the valve. Water starts flowing out. You've got a big puddle on the ground. Voltage, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, um, is your potential energy, right? You have the potential here for high voltage because you've got this water elevated. Uh, current is the amount of water that moves through this pipe, right? And um, resistance is when you, your pipe gets real small. On the multimeter, when you guys looked at it, you can actually measure electrical resistance. And that resistance is going to determine how much current flows through at a certain voltage. Wires, like we said earlier, are sized for current. Most of these switches and everything that has a label on it is going to tell you how much current it can take at a certain voltage. So we can measure resistance. One thing we can do is measure resistance like on this light bulb here. Intuitively, we think we should be able to measure resistance on this light bulb. Let me tell you why we can't. We want to know how many watts are in this light bulb. We can use Ohm's law, which is the relationship between voltage, amperage, and resistance. We know that this bulb goes into a 120 volt socket. We're going to put 120 volts on it. And we measured 18 ohms. So if you do the math there, what do we know? We know voltage and we know ohms. Current equals voltage divided by ohms. So we think, if we do that math, it tells us at 18 ohms, do you think this is a 6 and a half amp light bulb? Anybody who knows anything about electricity, it's not a six and a half amp light bulb, right? We know because we bought this light bulb that it's a 60 watt light bulb. It's not a 800 watt light bulb. So what actually happens is the resistance changes dramatically as the bulb heats up. This 60 watt light bulb, we know because it's 60 watts at 120 volts is only half an amp. Rarely come across an application where measuring resistance is something I need to know. When we did that work on the oven, one thing I did was measure uh, resistance and continuity on my little oven igniter. And I thought, OK, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out if this igniter is, is a broken circuit or not. Had continuity. I had some resistance. I had no idea what to do with that. I didn't know what that meant to me. Um, the only way that I could tell that my igniter was working was after I plugged it in and let it get warmed up. And then, and then you put your clamp over it, and you measure the actual amperage moving through it at this voltage, in which case you can tell that it's drawn the amount of power that it should. Okay, There are plenty of places where you can go and get instruction on Ohm's law. Motors. We do need to know a little bit about motors, though, because they're everywhere. We've got some motors on the table over here. You guys can look at this. This actually came off that hot dog rolling machine. <laughs> Service factor. Which is probably these things are like, um, yeah, yeah, well, OK, so the SF, the, the full load amps, if the SF is 1, it should be full load amps times service vector. Or, and then that'll give you the service vector amps. And that's basically telling you how much you can overload it. Yeah. The farther it gets away, the power factor gets lower. Because if it theoretically got way behind, there could be no power. Yeah. Um, so what we need to know about motors when we're looking at a nameplate, first off, we need to know the voltage rating of the motor. Um, we need to know a little bit about the amperage. We need to know its full load amps. And then we need to get some sort of sense of its service factor amps. Now, service factor represents the red line. How hard can you push your motor? Right? If you have a 10 amp motor with a service factor of 1.1, then you do not go over 11 amps, right? or you're going to completely burn your motor up. Right? That means that you can push it a little hard sometimes. 
when you flip it on, a lot of motors require a lot of power just to get moving. We call that the surge current or the inrush current. When you get a fuse, say for your motor, you want to get a time delay fuse that will accommodate that inrush current, right? If you get a fast blow fuse, then it's going to pop as soon as you turn your motor on, right? If you get a fuse based on your service factor amps. We're not really going to talk about selecting fuses. Um, that is, it gets really complicated pretty quick to do it right. Instead, we're going to talk just replacing fuses. You know, if you get into a piece of equipment and you need to replace it, then at least we'll know the terminology to get in there and replace it with the right fuse. Your voltage times your amps. Watts is a measure of power. How much power does this motor take? Horsepower is, I think, 750-ish watts in one horsepower. 746. 746, okay, yeah. Uh, a couple other things we need to look at on our motor, especially if you're like me and we're going in the junkyard and trying to find this stuff. Look at the phase. This is a single phase motor. That means that this will run on our common household electricity, right? Now, if it's a three-phase motor, that's one you're going to see in commercial and industrial applications. You're going to see a lot of three-phase motors. That means there's actually three lines of power coming in that alternate at different waveforms, right? Single phase is it's basically one waveform, right? And then your three phase is going to be three that are out of sync with each other. Actually, a much more efficient way to run a motor. Um, but we're, we're mostly going to talk about single phase because Chances are, if you've got a small farm or, or you're working around your house and you've got single phase to work with. Um, so look for phase one. That means single phase. Sometimes you'll hear that expressed as split phase. Hertz is 60. That's just what we have here in America, 60 hertz. If you go to the junkyard, I found all kinds of weird stuff from France and all over the world. And it's not going to be 60 hertz. Don't even bother bringing it home. A couple other things in here, volt 115. You'll hear people say 110, 115, 120 interchangeably. It all basically means the same thing. Here's your service factor amps down here, 6.9. Full load amps, 6.1 times the service factor. I can't see that number. It's going to make your service factor amps. Again, think of that service factor amps as your red line. Don't go above that. Check this out. This little diagram down here shows you how you can change the leads around in your motor to reverse it. This motor is thermally protected. That means it has an internal, it's not necessarily a fuse, but it will break the circuit if it reaches, and it's thermally activated, if it reaches a certain amperage for a certain amount of time, then the switch will open and it'll cut off power to the motor until it cools down. When you get into some, some real industrial motors, a lot of times they'll have an external thermal protection that's uh, uh, built into a, a, some sort of a motor contactor starter. For our purposes, let's look for motors that are thermally protected and then we don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is put it on an appropriate size circuit breaker. Here's a way that you can reverse a DC motor. A lot of DC motors will just have one positive and a negative lead. If you hooked up the positive to your negative pole on your battery and your negative to the positive pole, that thing will spin backwards. So that, that's called reversing polarity. And you can make a lot of DC motors spin backwards just by reversing polarity. You guys recognize that switch? The double pole, double throw switch? Follow that path there. Positive comes in, goes here. Goes to the positive side of the motor, right? Negative comes in, goes to the negative side of the motor. Now, if you were to switch both of these, now positive would go this way, come across, and go to the negative side of the motor. I believe all you have to do is switch two leads, right? And it gives you the pinout. It says, Connect red wire to yellow wire to, you know, neutral. Connect blue wire to line. And then just connect these three together. Now, if you were to switch one, I, I don't know which one it would say on the side of this. Switch orange and switch red. Now, you could do that. You could switch orange and red with the double pole, double throw switch. This is an example of a drum switch. Notice the switch in action on this guy. We have to change uh, two leads instead of just change one lead. Right. Okay, so this came off the uh, huge lathe at the junkyard. So you can see the horsepower ratings on this guy, too. So let's say that you've got a nice three-phase motor that you want to um, power off a single-phase power. You can use what's called a VFD, it's a variable frequency drive. That's what we would use them for. We actually use one of these over at our warehouse. 
So we have one of these for, for two purposes. The primary purpose that most people are going to use a VFD is for motor speed control. Um, uh, what, again, what we were using it for is we had a single phase power source and we had a three phase um, motor. You know, you can get these now for as low as 100 bucks, or you could spend thousands on them. A good place to look for these is Automation Direct. Love these guys. They can actually be pretty energy efficient, too. Instead of being a resistor, it'll actually limit the amount of power that even goes in. Some people use them for controlled acceleration and controlled torque. When you turn the motor on, it pulls a lot of current at first. You can use these to, to actually r slowly ramp up a motor so that it doesn't pull a whole lot of current when it starts up. What they'll do in commercial industrial applications, if you're going to run that motor at full speed most of the time, then there'll be some sort of a bypass around this thing. But if you want to run it slow speed sometimes, then you can re-engage this. So find a VFD that can tolerate the maximum current. Talk to an expert. Again, those guys at Automation Direct have always been really helpful with me if I need to call. If you just know a little bit about what you're talking about, then they're willing to engage. How about some little DC power supplies? You guys uh, know the car battery. You know the wall wart. You might not recognize this. Who recognizes this? And we actually kind of hacked one of these, found some instructions online, and we got ourselves a little. This is what it looked like coming out. Again, got this for 50 cents, I'm sure. Yeah. And we put little posts. We actually looked at the pinout on this, found it, you know, and you can look with your little multimeter, you can do a voltage test. You can find what's common. You can find what puts out 5 volts, what puts out 3.5 or 3.3, and what puts out 12. So we've got ourselves a little bench top DC power supply. So what we've done, I think it's black. I think it's your 12 volts. What we did was basically just bundle up all the blacks on this post. And now we've got a 12-volt positive and a ground post. Um, we use this thing all the time. Testing DC circuits before we'll put them on a battery. One thing you might not know about the wall wart, this is something that was new to me when I was looking for a power supply at Goodwill for my Arduino. OK, input 120 volts, 60 hertz. Great, that's our wall socket. Output 12 volt DC. It'll provide this much current, 500 milliamps. That's pretty common, whatever. What I didn't realize up here was you're looking for one that is center pin positive. Do you see this little uh, diagram up here? I've actually got one of these wall warts I can pass around. See that little diagram down there? Mm -hmm. That'll tell you if it's center pin positive or center pin negative. That means when you go to test this with a multimeter, you stick one probe inside and one on the outside, and you find which one is positive or negative. Now, if you get one that's not right, if it's center pin negative and you hook it up, I mean, you're going to stand a chance of frying whatever it is you're hooking it up to. So what does it say on it? Does it say center, center pin? No. So yeah, let me, let me draw it over here. Yeah, that little symbol right there. And it'll say negative, positive, right? Something you guys might not know, which is helpful, is that the short side of your wall outlet is the line side. It'll connect to your little brass screw. And the, the large blade is your neutral side. And this is always your ground down here. So when I'm doing a lot of work, especially if I'm doing anything that's going out in the greenhouse or in any kind of uh, you know, uh, moisture control facility. Um, I'm going to use a GFI. And, um, you know, GFI is, the, is what you're going to see in your bathroom or your kitchen. It's got the little button where you can reset it. I'll just buy one of these little GFI whips or whatever you would call that. Pretty helpful. They're maybe 20 bucks or so, but it gives you that peace of mind in case you have a short somewhere, which can happen in these human environments. You guys understand how two legs of power combine to make 240? All right, your common uh, breaker panel has three wires that come into it, right? And those three wires are coming off the transformer up on the power pole. You've got line one, line two, and neutral, OK? What happens, a lot of, they'll come in through a big breaker at the top called your main breaker. And then it'll go off. And what it'll do is branch off on little circuits like this. And there'll be a breaker on each one of these. And here's your big neutral bar. 
Now, if you take your meter and you measure from, say, like here to here, you're going to get 120 volts. If you measure from here to here, you're going to get 120 volts. If you measure from here to here, you're going to get 240 volts, right? So when you look in your breaker panel and you see the little one uh, single breaker, that's for a 120 volt outlet or lights or whatever load somewhere in your house, right? And it's just going to be like that, right? So you, anything that comes off of that breaker, if you measure from there to neutral, you get 120 volts. Now, if you have a, what they call a, a double pole breaker, it's where you flip both breakers at the same time. So they're like physically connected, so you can't switch one without switching the other. It's going to look like this, right? OK, so you got power going out and power going out. And now on a, on a 240 volt circuit in your house, you, you're not going to have a neutral at all. You're not measuring between here and neutral. You're, you're basically just taking line one and line two, and you'll have a ground, but you don't, you technically you don't need that neutral, OK? Most of the time, in any one of these outlets, we're going to have four wires going in. We'll have a, uh, a line. Well, we'll have three, sorry. We'll have a line. We'll have a neutral and a ground. Um, what a lot of people wouldn't un don't, don't know right away is that ground actually ties into neutral right before it leaves your house. OK, so neutral and ground are electrically connected throughout your house. Do y'all have any questions on that? That's why you can skip out the neutral when you do the, uh, or you can skip out the ground when you do the neutral? That's why a lot of people are going to skip out of ground. And the green wire is there only for protection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Testing for voltage, though, you are just going to look between two different points. DC, you got to pay attention to that polarity. The red you know, goes on your positive, and the black is going to go to your ground. If you reverse those, you're just going to get a negative reading on your multimeter. AC won't matter. A lot of multimeters, you're either going to have an auto range multimeter, or you're going to have to select the range. Most of the new ones are going to have auto range in, and, uh, and it's just going to know if it's 120 volts or if it's 240. Some of them, like the older style ones, and I've got one older style one here, um, you have to say if, if what you're measuring is below 200 volts or above 200 volts, you have to, to go ahead and know that ahead of time. If you get a 1 or a 0, that indicates that you're out of range. Again, we're going to be redundant when we're testing voltage. Any questions on that before we move forward? Yes, how a ground fault works in the voltage? Uh, no, you want to? Sorry. And it would help explain why you need it. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. then they have arc fault now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So ground fault is basically looking at the, um, uh, it's looking at, I believe it's measuring the amperage coming in, and then it's measuring the amperage coming out. And in an AC circuit, it should actually be the same. And then if there's a slight difference above or below a certain set point, uh, in that ground fault, it'll just immediately trip the breaker. Yeah. So it's looking for leakage. You got a ground fault breaker, then everything on that wire is protected by that. Yeah. Or you can do the same thing by putting one at the needed location. Yeah. And then you can wire past it, and it uses that ground fault that's maybe in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're like putting outlets in your kitchen, you can have one ground fault outlet. And then every outlet around your countertop can be protected by that one ground fault. Low voltage controls is where you can run a series of switches and control high voltage things using low voltage, which is inherently safer and more economical. You can get away with some smaller wires. It's, in my opinion, a lot easier to install. Um, you can get into some more uh, complicated circuitry, which would be uh, uh, quite a bear if that stuff was built to uh, withstand 120 volts um, or larger. So your typical residential application is a doorbell and your thermostats. These are all things that are going to run at 24 volts or, or sometimes less. I bought a doorbell to put on this board. Um, and I had all this other 24 volt components. And I bought a 16 volt doorbell. I didn't know that. I thought they were all 24 volts. So you know, it's in a box. It'll have to go back. But uh, anyway, that 16 volt doorbell cannot take 24 volts. 
24, again, it's typical. I think NEC is the National Electric Code. I think it's 49 volts or less. It's considered low voltage. And in a lot of cases, that means you don't need any kind of electrician's license to work on it, um, which that's helpful. So you're going to use it in your specialty switches, timers, thermostats, humidity, all this kind of fun stuff that we're going to get into. To get that low voltage, you need a step-down transformer. This one that I have pictured is a very common one. This might be called a tri-voltage. You're going to have incoming power. A lot of times you can find them that have incoming power is 120 volts, 60 hertz, and it'll step it down to 24, 16, or 8, right? So that's a nice one to have around. This is a simple 24 volt that can either take 240 or 120 input. So that's what these extra leads on this side are for. A real common one is a 40 volt amp rated 24 volt doorbell transformer. If you open up your heat pump, you'll see a 40 volt amp, 24 volt transformer inside of it. You can go to Lowe's and you can buy this. Or you go to the junkyard and you can probably walk out of there with a dozen if you want. We'll call that a step down transformer. They actually have step up transformers too. We're not really going to get into that. We do have one of those on our uh, oil burner over here, though, for the ignition system. Um, we actually step up from 120 to 10,000 volts so that we can shoot our little uh, um, spark to uh, ignite the oil as it moves past. Those are going to be in your microwaves, too. What are you going to use 24 volts for? How about a relay? Relays are fun. Relay, think of it as a powered switch. It's where one thing can control a switch. You don't have to walk over there and switch it yourself. A low voltage 24 volt relay is very common. They're everywhere. You can get a 120 volt relay too. Um, you can get whatever kind of relay you want, I'm sure. 12 volt relays are all over your car. If you're drawing a relay, it's going to look something like this on paper. What's happening here is there's a coil, and then there's this thing they call the armature which switches between these contacts. When you energize this coil, it creates a little magnetic field that'll pull that armature down. So just like these other switches, it's going to have a normally open and normally closed position. When that coil is de-energized, it's going to be in the normally open position. When you energize the coil, the switch throws down into the normally closed position. These are all relays. You'll hear this referred to as an ice cube relay. These are kind of neat because they have uh, interchangeable bases. Take a look at that relay. You know, it's nice. You can see inside of it. You can see the coil and everything. Okay, these are also relays. Uh, who recognizes this? That's your starter solenoid. That's basically a relay. It takes your ignition on your car when you crank the key. It activates this relay, sends power to this coil. And then it closes that switch, so it sends power from your battery to your starter. If you didn't have this, you would be pulling enough of a cable to energize your starter all the way up to your key and back, and you'd have to have a big, big switch to start your car. You know, instead, you can use a relay that takes this little control circuit in your car to activate a larger circuit. So in this case, we're taking 12 volts DC small wire and controlling 12 volts DC big wire. Here's another 12 volt DC relay. This is more of like a component PC board level relay. Here's another relay that you might see in your car. This is pretty common relay type as well. All of these are doing the same thing. They've got a coil. Two of these blades on the here represent a coil. There's three left over. One of those is going to be common. One's going to be open, and one's going to be normally closed. So let's look at some fun things that we can do with relays now that we know about relays. We did hot water heating systems. And we would sometimes add a, uh, a, a booster coil to your furnace where you can take hot water and you can preheat the air going to your furnace before your furnace kicks in. So um, you know the theory there was that preheated air, your furnace won't have to work as hard. You'll save oil or electricity or however your furnace is powered. Um, it's debatable how efficient those things really are. It slows down your fan quite a bit. It's another load on the the heat pump or the furnace or whatever. You have wires coming from your thermostat. If you open up a heat pump thermostat, you may have seven or eight different wires on the back of that thing. They all go to control different things down at your heat pump. Blue is your common wire. That's your return line. Orange, a typical orange wire out of a heat pump thermostat cuts on your compressor. So your compressor cuts on whether you're heating or whether you're cooling. You're still going to run your compressor. Now, the yellow wire oftentimes, not always, but the yellow wire energizes this thing they call the reversing valve, 
which in most heat pumps is only activated when you're cooling. So what I'll show you is how we used a couple of relays to, um, to make sure that we only send heat to the furnace when we're in heating mode, right? So here I've got a relay drawn, these two little dots, um, or, or sorry, the R and the C represent 24 volts. A lot of times when you're talking 24 volts, I don't really know why they do this, but C is common, R is 24 volts. That's your line side or your live wire on your 24 volts. So we have blue, our common wire is always going down to C. I, I miss it here, but blue on common. When orange is hot, when you're calling for heat or cooling, orange is gonna have 24 volts on it. That orange wire comes down here, activates the relay. Now power coming from our system lands on common and goes to the normally open. Now we have power that can pass through this relay and go over here to this second relay, right? And this second relay is only um, energized when we're cooling, when we've got that reversing valve activated, right? So in this case, our 24 volts goes out on the normally closed because what we want is power when we're heating to pass through both of these relays. Come down here, turn on whatever it is we're using to control our pump that sends hot water to the heating coil. All right, when we're cooling, this circuit actually breaks because we're moving from the normally closed to the normally open side. This is how I used, it's called an Arduino. It's a microprocessor that you can get in and you can program it literally to do almost whatever you want. My first Arduino project that we did out here, I used an Arduino and an Arduino breakout relay board. Arduino relays are five volts. You know, the whole Arduino runs it, it's on a five volt system. So I used these little five volt relays to take a 12 volt DC control circuit, make it or break it, and energize two larger relays, 12 volt relays now, that can send power to my motor. And remember we looked at the motor reversing diagram? That's all we're doing right here is motor reversing. I'm switching the polarity with these two larger relays, but I'm using these two small relays to make sure that if there's an error in my programming and both of these relays are activated at the same time, that we never have the possibility that we're sending 12 volts to both sides of that motor. So what you got here is positive coming in, lands on the common of that relay, and would go out on the normally open if relay one says, let's move this motor forward, let's apply positive on positive. If we want to move the motor backwards, we're in reverse. And the only way that we can be in reverse is if power flows from the normally closed on relay one to the common on relay two. If relay one is activated, 12 volts goes out on normally open. If relay one is deactivated, 12 volts can go out on the normally closed. So these are fun ways that you can use relays to isolate circuits. You can manipulate circuits to, to do a lot of really interesting things. This is a solenoid. It's basically, instead of a switch, it's just a, a, basically a relay activated valve. It uses that same mechanism that's in a relay to open and close a valve. This is a solid state relay. This is just a different kind of relay that doesn't use that electrical. It can actually, it's capable of switching at fast speeds. And this over here is a contactor, very similar to a relay, but uh, usually reserved for very large load switching. It's also, you're gonna see have three poles. It's for switching three phase motors. You, you know, you can mod them out. You can build on as many additional control switches on there that you want to. And a lot of tractors are, are built so that they can have the external, remember we talked about the thermal disconnect on the motors? A lot of contactors have built-in terminals for adding uh, disconnects. Just recognize it if you see it, that if you see a box that looks a lot like that, it's gonna be a contactor. It's gonna behave in a very similar way. We used a, a contactor on one of our projects where we had a, um, giant mixer, concrete mixer, on a stand. And we just used it to turn compost. And all we wanted it to do was, um, I wanted a timer to basically turn my compost pile um, twice a day, but I only wanted that thing to rotate, basically one rotation, which took about, I think, I don't remember, it was like 12 seconds or something. Or, 
whatever. So I had a timer that said, like, send power, you know, control power to my contactor and close those switches, turn that uh, concrete mixer on for 12 seconds, turn it off. 12 hours later, turn it on for four seconds. So I could use literally a little $30 clock timer to control my massive, like, 20 horsepower motor or something. It was huge. And, but you got to use a, a real contactor to do that, something that's rated for 20 horsepower. Again, I called Automation Direct, and they helped me out with that. I told them exactly what I wanted to do, and they made a list of all the components for me. Well, what can we build now that we know about relays? We can do um, quite a bit. If you guys look in your papers, we can see a few things. And if you all feel like getting up and moving, we can go around and, and actually look at some systems around the facility if you want. Yeah, let's go out to the greenhouse. I'll show you a system that um, only uses relays to control. 